And that is the last prayer of the Bible, isn't it? And Jesus is coming soon. At this time, we'll dismiss our jammers. Jammers, out you go for your jam sessions. That's grades K through 5. They have their own church service <clears throat> next door in the Christian Ed building. Tonight at 5 o'clock, Jimmy DeYoung will be here to answer questions. And at 6 o'clock, give a second exciting presentation on Bible prophecy. And now let's give a warm chapel in Marlboro welcome to our good friend, Jimmy DeYoung. God bless you today, Jimmy. Thank, Thank you, you for sir. coming. Booker Tove. You don't speak when you're spoken to? I just said good morning in Hebrew. No, no, I said Hebrew. Boker Tov. Try that, please. Boker Tov. Not broken toe, sir. Broken toe. I mean, Boker Tov. He's got me saying it. B O K E R T O V. Boker Tov. What I literally said, remember in English we read left to right, but in Hebrew you read right to left. So we speak one direction, they think the other direction. Boker is morning, tov is good. So literally what I said was morning good. Boker tov. Try it one more time. Boker tov. I want you to be able to greet Jesus when you get to heaven. So as we're going to speak Hebrew forever, you better start learning the lessons. How about say shalom? Say it again twice. One shalom is a greeting. Judy and I have been past. 28 and a half years. Came her tov. Now, what's wrong? Am I so? It does it sometimes. Boker tov is the greeting for good morning. But when you see somebody, then you say shalom. That's like saying hello. And then after a bit of a conversation, uh, you uh, conclude the salutation. You say shalom, shalom. You can tell whether they're coming or going real easy. One shalom, they're coming to, they're going. And may I ask you not to stand up during the service and say shalom, shalom, and start walking out. I will quit when I get finished. So you just keep in there, and we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Well, a joy for me and Judy to be able to have the opportunity. And I want to tell you something. I am amazed at your song leader, your director, your music guy. That guy is amazing. He is a quartet in one person. He's singing, playing the guitar, beating the drum, and beating the cymbals. I can hardly chew gum and walk at the same time, much less doing what, he is amazing, yes. <laughs> that was great. I just, I'm a music guy from way back, and uh, so I, I can appreciate when a music guy does something that outstanding, and I was just really excited to watch him do that. By the way, how do you like the way the auditorium is set up? It's got everything perfect. You've got the cross behind me. You've got the pulpit right here, and you have the drum set. That's what you need in a church service. Cross, pulpit, drum set. And so we're all set, ready to go for this time, teasing Matt just a little bit, but uh, he does an excellent job. You know what, I was, uh, I was amazed by him. There's not too many music men that when I ask, and Judy uh, and I always love when we're gonna have a teaching on Bible prophecy, to have the focus, the music program focused on what I'm gonna be speaking on. And did you notice every single song that Matt let you in and the one he did for the offertory, focused on the return of Jesus Christ. In fact, in my quiet time this morning, I read from Philippians chapter two, verses 10 and 11. That's, I read the whole chapter, but verses 10 and 11 says that every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. It was right there in one of the songs, very biblical. So I appreciated that so much. Well, great to have you along. Let me just remind you what the pastor said this evening. We'll have a prophecy Q&A from five o'clock, about 45 minutes, and then at six o'clock, I'll be speaking. And I've chosen tonight to speak on the Persian Gulf and prophecy. Very interesting things in the last 48 to 72 hours have been taking place in the Persian Gulf. 
Banner over my website says that I look at current events in light of biblical prophecy. Now, that's what we do when I go to churches. In fact, pastors usually ask me, will you please give us a title for the messages? And I tell my daughter, Jody, just tell them I'm going to be looking at current events in light of biblical prophecy. I do not know how much more up to date we can get than looking and focusing on the Persian Gulf and Bible prophecy and what's going to be taking place there seemingly in the very near future. And then tomorrow night, we'll have a prophecy Q&A. The service is at 7, and at 7 o'clock, I'm going to be speaking tomorrow night on the recent election that took place there in Jerusalem. You might have noticed, if you were reading the news headlines about it, Prime Minister Netanyahu was incapable of putting a coalition government together. He basically should have been the prime minister. He's the longest reigning prime minister in the history of the state of Israel. He was going into his fifth decade as a servant of the people of Israel, uh, but uh, he, was able, he was unable to be able to put that coalition together, stopped by one of his former chiefs of staff of his own political party. But uh, they're going to have to go to another election. That will be September the 17th. That has put a real kink in President Trump's deal of the century, the peace process. But it has a great significance as it relates to Bible prophecy. I want you to join us, if you can, on Monday evening at the 7 o'clock hour uh, to study that with me. It's the most solid evidence that we have of the reality of the authority and the truth and authenticity of the person of Jesus Christ and his capability of telling us what the future is going to hold. So this will be a great study in God's word. Monday night, 7 o'clock, 6 o'clock, we'll open up for a, about a 45-minute session of Prophecy Q&A. And I just enjoy that. It's invigorating to me. I would love for you to come. You can ask me any prophecy question you would like to. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor, if you will. Uh, since it's hard to project to a bunch of empty seats, for the prophecy Q&A, if you will, just gather in this section right here. I hope there's a stool so I can rest. I'm an old man, uh, but then I will sit here and take any of your prophecy questions. And then I, the same thing, if you could just come down here. Now listen, I'm going to only keep you for 45 minutes. I promise I'll give you a 15-minute break where you can go find your seat that you've been sitting in for the last 20 years. But if you will, come down here and join us as we have Prophecy Q&A answering any prophecy question you would like to ask. You know, my heart was thrilled. Started skipping a beat or two this morning when I drove into the churchyard, I saw the flags at the entrances. I was looking at those flags yesterday when Judy and I came over, pastor came to help us unload and prepare, put our materials on the table back there for your possible purchase. And uh, I, I was waiting for the pastor to arrive and I was watching those flags. I don't know if a flag excites you or not, but the United States of America's flag does excite me and waving in the breeze like it was yesterday. My heart started getting excited. Same thing happened this morning. Whenever I see a flag, I want to stand up. I want to salute it. I want to say the Pledge of Allegiance to it. I'm just honored to have an opportunity to honor the flag of the United States of America. And of course, we're moving towards the 4th of July on Thursday. Many of you will be taking a day off, possibly the rest of the weekend off, in order to be able to be with your family on Independence Day, the birthday of this nation. And we'll stop to think about all of the things that happen. I've been producing another documentary, a DVD documentary entitled, Is the United States in Bible Prophecy? And we're not quite finished. We've done all the filming for it. We are now on the last stage of preparing a DVD documentary. That's the final edit to get everything corrected. I don't know if you've ever heard of a man named Paul Blair. He's now a pastor in Edmond, uh, in the Oklahoma, Edmond, Oklahoma. And Paul graduated from Oklahoma State, was an All-American football player. He 
He's about 6'9", weighs about 290, and he uh, was, he played professional football with the Chicago Bears when Jim McMahon was the quarterback. He was the starting guard on the line for the offensive line, and uh, he went to the Super Bowl. I mean, he's just an outstanding ball player, but a great preacher, and he's an expert on how this nation got its foundation. You might not remember quite all the details, but if you remember the pilgrims, the pilgrims, they came and arrived here in the United States a little bit over 400 years ago. They landed at a place called Plymouth, Massachusetts. So we went up there to start this DVD documentary wanting to know if the United States has any place in Bible prophecy. We started there and Paul gave us the entire story how William Bradford was a member of a church. Uh, they were there in England. They had to leave there, went to Holland, and then decided they were going to come to the New World, the United States of America, which was not the United States of America. Then it was simply America. And so 52 of these people in the church who were relying upon God's word to be able to put together a new government in a new land, they left and came here to America. They were confronted by the Indians. The Indians helped them establish their colony, the Plymouth Plantation there. After about 10 years, the Puritans came over and they needed some assistance. They went into Boston and the pilgrims left about 30 miles south and went up to Boston to help the the Puritans established a location, a government up there. And their government was based upon the word of God. You see, God ordained human government in the ninth chapter of the book of Genesis in verse 6. And that set the basis upon which these pilgrims and these Puritans established our nation. From Boston Common, where there was great preaching during the time of the awakening, we went over to Concord, where the shot heard around the world was heard. And when a preacher man had trained up his congregation to stand up against the great British Empire, they stood. Many of them fell, that first shot fired, to establish the United States of America. A wonderful story. It's a, an exciting story, and it's the basis upon which our government operates. Ultimately, after the Revolutionary War, you know what took place, the Declaration of Independence, the Declaration of the United States of America, July 4, 1776. But it's the basis upon which our nation has been established. We want to be thinking about some of these things instead of how many hot dogs or hamburgers we can eat on July the 4th, or how many firecrackers we're going to fall off. These are some of the principles upon which our nation was established. A biblical principle that established America to make it the launch pad for world evangelization. That's an exciting thing to celebrate on July the 4th. But you know, if you study the Word of God, you can go place after place after place, and find out how God has used human government. He does that to direct humankind. He established human government so he could have his will fulfilled. Take your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation. Am I doing something wrong, Pastor? Just don't move. Well, that's like telling a cat not to climb. Anyway, I'll try to be still. I'm sorry, but here we are, chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. Now, let me give you just a little bit of information as it relates to the book of Revelation, chapter 17. When you study God's prophetic word, in particular in the book of Revelation, I suggest you have to do it chronologically, not numerically. 
In other words, you don't go chapters 1 to 22 in my understanding of how to understand this book. You go chronologically, the first three chapters, and you go to chapter 4 and verse 1 when John heard, as it were, a trumpet talking with him, which said, come up hither, apocalyptic literature, referring to the rapture of the church. When you see chapter 4, verse 1, he was on earth. Chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 2, he's in the heavenlies. In chapter 5, verse 1, there's someone on the throne, and it's not Jesus Christ. It's his Father, God the Father. When you go to chapter 5, and you, this is, by the way, chapters 4 and 5 of the book of Revelation are the only windows that we have into the third heaven. So if you want to have some idea what the third heaven is like, you have to look at the situation there as it relates to what God lays out in those two chapters, chapters four and five. Over in verse seven, it says, and Jesus at the right hand of the Father moves over to take the sealed book, which is the title deed to the earth, which is the first of the seven judgments that are gonna take place, the seven sealed judgments. There's three sets of those, seven trumpet judgments, seven vile judgments. Now I'm reminding you of what pastor's been teaching you. He told me last evening he is teaching the book of Revelation, and uh, I'm excited about that. There's not too many pastors are teaching the book of Revelation. They try to ignore that book, but your pastor's going to take a literal approach to teaching the book of Revelation. When you get over to chapter 17, you're talking about the first three and a half years of the seven-year period of time. You have the rapture, and then there's a period of time, and then you have the return of Jesus Christ. During that seven-year period of time, there's 16 chapters in the book of Revelation. Two through chapter 19, verse 11, and in that period of time, he describes the terrible tribulation period, that which is going to happen and unfold on this earth, while something else, of course, the marriage supper of the Lamb taking place in the heavenlies. Well, we see this is the case, and when you get to chapter 17, which is a part of that seven-year description, we look and we see in verse 9, it talks about a seven-hilled city, which would be, and I do believe, the city of Rome, Italy. It's going to be the headquarters for a mother-son cult, as talked about in verse 5 of chapter 17. It's going to be headquartered in Rome, a mother-son cult that has was established actually in the book of Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4, uh, where Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, had a son named uh, Tammuz, and that became the mother-son cult, and it can be traced throughout the entire Bible. I'm not trying to teach on chapter 17, and we'll give you a little bit of background. The word beast, which is the name for Antichrist in chapter 17, is used eight times. When you also study the word whore is used three times, the word harlot is used one time. And that is dictating to us that this is the false church that will be headquartered in the city of Rome led by the Antichrist. So that's a little bit of background on chapter 17. Pastor will really get deeper into that and give you much more information as he studies through. But let me show you what's going to happen at the end of the first three and a half years. In other words, halfway through the seven-year period of time. Look here in verse 16. And the ten horns, and by the way, that would be referring to the revived Roman Empire. There in verse 12, one hour with the beast, they received their power, revived Roman Empire, a revival of the old Roman Empire that disappeared about 476 A.D. Now, verse 16, and the ten horns, the revived Roman Empire, uh, that thou sawest upon the beast, that would be the Antichrist, they shall hate the whore, they shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And so at the midway point of the tribulation period, the first three and a half years of this seven-year period of time, the Antichrist is going to move forward to destroy this false church. We know that he's going to go from there over to Jerusalem. I'll get to that in a moment. But look what happens, verse 17. And this is the verse I want to focus on for this time and for tonight as well. Why did they do this? Why did they destroy the false church at the midway point of the tribulation? 
Verse 17, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Now look at the last part of the verse. Until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Do you understand what I've just told you? I gave you a background for the United States of America. A governmental operation that the Lord himself ordained. And here we see now that God is going to use this system of human government ultimately to accomplish his will. In other words, political leaders are going to make political decisions to set prophecy in place. That's a principle that's applicable from Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, when he brought human government into existence. When I take the time to give you those examples at Q&A, if you'd like to ask me some of the examples, I'd be thrilled to be able to do that at 5 o'clock this afternoon. But just take my word for it now. God will take political leaders, allowing them to make political decisions to set prophecy in place. That's what happens here. The Lord puts in the hearts and minds of the revived Roman Empire. I believe the infrastructure for the revived Roman Empire today is the European Union and everything we see unfolding. Somebody says, well, I thought you only had to have 10 members. Well, they have 28 members right now. Great Britain wants to get out. That'd make 27. I don't know if you know this or not, but 17 other members are getting ready to exit the European Union as well. 28, take one out, 27, subtracts a, oh, that's 10. How about that number? That works pretty good with Daniel, chapter 7. And so God has and will, and this is talking about the future. Revelation 17, 17 is dealing with the future, not even today. It's dealing with the tribulation period. Albeit the principle is applicable today because those things that are going to happen in the future are going to be set in place by political leaders making political decisions to set prophecy in place. That's the principle of God's word. I've had a little experience in the area of uh, politics. Back in 1974, I ran, I was with Word of Life, an organization in upstate New York, I ran for school board up there, and all of a sudden, I was on the school board. Actually, when I got started, I went to a PTA meeting. They needed a president. I opened my mouth too much, so they made me president of the PTA. And then they should have not done that. That opened the cage for the tiger to get out, and I ran for school board, got elected, had some wonderful things happen, I want to tell you. But then I got excited. I was trying to get a congressman for our district, 39th Congressional District in upstate New York, and I wanted to have a, a godly man or woman to represent us in the United States Congress. I couldn't find one. I was in a meeting with a bunch of preachers one day, and I said, fellas, we need to have a good congressperson up here. And they said, well, who are we going to elect? I don't know. I can't find one. So how about you running? You know what I said? The the cop out. I'll pray about it. And some by pastor in the back jumped up. All right, let's pray about it right now. (laughs) And all of a sudden I'm trapped. So I ran for United States Congress in 1976. You might have heard of the guy who was running for president, Jimmy Carter. And we had already been friends because I was ahead of a radio station in South Georgia, Thomasville, 35 miles from Plains, Georgia. And Jimmy and I had already spent some time together. He was running for president. I'm running for the United States Congress. He won, I lost. Now, you know I lost because I'm here preaching this morning. Had I been elected to the United States Congress today, I would be president. Of course, humbly speaking, of course, that would be the case. But uh, in my point being, I got interested in the political arena. And it is so amazing how the Lord gives us experiences to help us fulfill his will. We've been in Israel for 28 and a half years. I've been a journalist in that location. Couldn't go in as a missionary. I came to go to be there as a missionary. We accomplished that. We started a church there. Started with about six people. It's running over 500 now to his glory. I praise the Lord for that opportunity. 
But because of my background and experience in the political arena, I was able to be able to communicate. I've had conversations with Benjamin Netanyahu. I interviewed Yasser Arafat one time, King Hussein of Jordan. Again, this is not brag. I didn't know I was going to do that. I didn't play. I didn't write that on a piece of paper. Okay, when you get to Israel, you're going to interview Benjamin Netanyahu. He was just simply the ambassador to the United Nations at that time. Marty Hanna and I were doing Day of Discovery over there, and one day before he had ever been elected as prime minister, we interviewed Netanyahu. And I told Mart after it was over, I said, that guy's going to be prime minister. Well, as soon as he happened, he said, are you a prophet or the son of a prophet? <laughs> you know? and because you can recognize some of those things, especially if that's your background. But I've also been watching presidents. Remember Jimmy Carter? I had experience in knowing him. And the last seven presidents, have you noticed decisions they have made? Decisions that were going to set Bible prophecy in place. Why? Because chapter 17, verse 17 of the book of Revelation, that principle was in play. I'll talk about one other tonight. In fact, it's Jimmy Carter and tell you what he did to establish everything with Iran. Very interesting. Political leaders making political decisions to set prophecy in place. And let me just look. At, I've got to pick one out, and I have no ulterior motive. Let me choose Donald Trump as the one I want to talk about. Now, I don't care if you love him or hate him. That's not my point. I'm not trying to promote him. I'm not trying to cut him down. I'm just going to use him as an example. Do you know what Donald Trump did on December the 6th, 19, uh, 2017, he stood in the White House and he made probably the most profound statement that's ever been made by any person, and in particular, a preacher. He announced to the world that Jerusalem was the political capital of the Jewish people. What did world leaders say? They went crazy. This is the beginning of World War III. Donald Trump doesn't know what he's doing. He's taking us to a worldwide war. Well, oh, I haven't seen that since 19, uh, 2017. I haven't seen it. I have seen since that time the U.S. Embassy that were for so many years located in Tel Aviv moved into Jerusalem. My two sons, Jim and Rick, were there the day it happened to witness, to report on it. We went worldwide on our network to tell about it. So many presidents had promised to do it. Yeah. But no president had ever said Jerusalem is the political capital of the Jewish people. And of course, logically, if it's the political capital, why you got your old embassy over there in Tel Aviv, move it to Jerusalem? That's where David Ben-Gurion placed the capital of the Jewish nation in 1948. But what was happening? A political leader making a political decision to set prophecy in place. That is what was happening. And, and he dealt with Jerusalem. How profound is that? The word Jerusalem is used 674 times in the entire Bible. It's used in the first book of the Bible, the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis, when it's talking about Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem. Go to Psalm 72, Salem is Jerusalem. It's used in the last book, next to the last chapter, chapter 21, when he talks about the new Jerusalem. It's a key location a major component in Bible prophecy. Let me just illustrate that. And I think two times ago when I was here, I did mention Jerusalem. But I want to show you in the period of judgment, the tribulation period, how Jerusalem is going to be so key and major. And what we have seen now, a president making a political decision to set prophecy in place has set the stage for these prophecies to be fulfilled. Go back to chapter 11 just a second. Chapter 11, pastor told me he's uh, in chapter 11, and uh, he's going to start with verse 3, talking about the two witnesses next time he teaches. And so I said, okay, well, let me just kind of give it a little introduction here, and uh, we'll then let you go from there. Look at verses 1 and 2. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and this would be at the midway point of the tribulation. 
And there was given to me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar of them that worship therein. Verse 2. But the court which is without the temple, leave it out, measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, now notice, and the holy city shall they tread down underfoot forty and two months. Luke 21, 24, that's where Jesus made that exact same statement. And Jerusalem should be trodden down of the Gentiles for three and a half years. Okay, now let me just show you what he said here. That's Jerusalem. Notice what he says in verse 2. And the holy city shall they tread. The holy city. Daniel chapter 9, verses 16, chapter 9, verse 20. Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 2 says, Jerusalem is the holy city. So what we're seeing that's going to unfold during that seven-year period of time after the rapture of the church is going to be a temple in the city of Jerusalem. A temple. That's key. That's one of the ingredients that's a must that has to be there. And you may be thinking, well, Dr. DeYoung, there is no temple in Jerusalem. Hey, I know. I lived there, remember? 18 and a half years. There's no temple. There's a gold dome building in the spot where that temple stood. I understand that. That gold dome building has to come down because that's the exact spot that temple has to be built. But that event would only take about uh, maybe six months at the most. Really, all they have to do is put up an altar and they can start the temple sacrificial system, which is a part of operating that temple. They can do that. They did that in the time of the second temple when Zerubbabel came back to rebuild Solomon's temple. So I know that's a precedent that can be followed. But I want to remind you, there will be a tribulation temple. Now, in the kingdom, let's say the rapture's over there, here's leading up to the tribulation period, and then here's the second coming of Christ. After that, the kingdom is not today in place. The kingdom is in the future. How do I know the kingdom is not in place? Well, in Matthew 24, what did Jesus say? Chapter 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation. Verse 30, I'm going to come in the clouds with great power and great glory. Was there any other witness to that? Yeah, God the Father. Book of Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And I will give my son, Jesus Christ, the kingdom, his dominion forever. When are you going to do that, God the Father? When I see him coming in the clouds with great power and great glory. Can I ask you a question? Anybody in here seen Jesus coming in the clouds of great power and great glory? Please raise your hand. May I report nobody raised their hand? That means the kingdom is not now in operation. Get that out of your mind. This is not the kingdom, period. It's when he comes back immediately after the seven-year tribulation period. That's when the kingdom was put in place. And then he will build a temple. But in that seven-year period of time leading up to the return of Jesus Christ, there has to be a temple. I said it'd take about six months maybe to build it. How long would it take that, take that gold dome building down? 30 seconds. We could get that out of the way quickly. But you know you need 28,000 priests to operate the temple? For 25 years, I've been documenting. They have trained 28,000 men who say they are the tribe of Levi, qualified to be priest at the temple. In all their priestly garments, they've made every one of them. King David called for 4,000 harps to be played when the temple stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Nick and Shoshana Harari, a couple from Vermont, Jewish couple that moved to Israel, they've made them. They're all in storage, ready to go. Wow. Oh, there were a couple of red heifers, if you know about the old red heifer. And if I'm saying something you don't know, ask me at Q&A. That's what the purpose for Q&A is. Uh, there was a couple of red heifers born the last two months over there in 2018. They were disqualified. Ten days ago, there was another red heifer that was born. They're watching it in the Negev Desert. I talked to three men who went to the Ark of the Covenant. It's underneath the Dome of the Rock. All those preparations, in fact, everything I've just said, I document on this DVD, ready to rebuild, revisit it. And so chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, 
So it's in that seven year period of time as it relates to Jerusalem, there has to be a temple there. Go to chapter 13. Look over here in chapter 13. It's the most detailed passage of scripture on the Antichrist. The Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to be a human being that will be energized by Satan. It says in chapter 13, he gets his power, his seat of authority from Satan himself. And he's going to do signs, wonders, and miracles. Boy, we have a proliferation of those today. And uh, he's going to do all kinds of things to destroy the people on this earth, especially those who want to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, especially the Jewish people. He wants to wipe them all out. But then... After he finishes his work in Rome with that false church, he comes over to Jerusalem, and there's a temple in Jerusalem. The second Thessalonians 2, 4 says he walks into the temple, and he claims to be God. You know what they call that? The abomination of desolation. What did Daniel say? He said, that's going to happen in the seven-year tribulation period. What did Jesus say? When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, flee, get out of town. That's going to happen at the midway point. Why? Because first of all, there's a temple, and then there's going to be a tyrant that shows up. And once he walks into that holy temple, he takes care of the abomination of desolation. He then goes over to Babylon, the city of Babylon, located on the shores of the Euphrates River, 58 miles out of downtown Baghdad. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, the false prophet... The false prophet is a member of the satanic trinity. He puts up a statue, a statue of the Antichrist, an image of him. If you've got chapter 13, notice what he says in verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And then he said, I'm going to cause everybody that doesn't worship that beast, I'm going to cause everybody to if they don't worship the beast and take the mark of the beast, be killed. So that's an absolute. That's not you, folks. We're out of here at the rapture of the church. This is a group of people who go into the tribulation period. Some of them will get saved. Some of them will reject Jesus Christ. But they're all going to have to take the mark of the beast on the forehead or the back of the hand and worship Satan. In other words, they're going to have to bow every single day towards what city? Jerusalem. It's key in understanding Bible prophecy. Every Jew in the world today, if he's not in Jerusalem, he bows. I don't care where he is, Miami, Florida, New York City, Hong Kong, wherever, he bows towards Jerusalem to pray. Every Muslim, five times a day, bows towards Mecca to pray. And these people with the mark of the beast on the forehead and the back of the hand, these people that worship Satan, they're going to have to bow towards Jerusalem. Jerusalem has to be active with a temple and a tyrant. Look here in chapter 19. Chapter 19, it's amazing. The Lord gets on his white horse, chapter 19 and verse 11, and he comes out of the heavenlies. In verse 14, you and I in the heavenlies get on a white horse. We come out of heaven following him back to the earth. At that point in time, God the Father is going to give him his kingdom, a theocracy. You know, that's what he had. The first three chapters of the book of Genesis. What was that? A theocracy. That's what God put in place. In fact, he made Adam and Eve king. He gave them dominion. Let us give them dominion. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 27, and 28. He was making them king and queen. That was his plan. It's always been to set up a kingdom on earth. But what is the plan for Jesus? And when he comes back to the earth after a seven-year period of time in the heavenlies and the marriage supper of the Lamb and hell breaking out on earth with the tribulation period, he comes back to the Mount of Olives to receive his kingdom, his theocracy. But you know what is in place since Genesis chapter 3 all the way over to Revelation chapter 20? The Satanocracy. Yeah, he 
Ephesians 2.2. 2. Prince of the power of the air, Satan. When he comes back, Jesus Christ is going to have to take care of Satan. He's going to have to deal. Man, I'm just touching the pulpit, it does it. I'm my fault. I'm so, please forgive me, folks. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what I'm doing here, but please forgive me. Um, where was I before I rudely interrupted myself? <laughs> uh, what's going to happen? She's got to get rid of this Satanocracy. You remember that very interesting little phrase over in the book of um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37? As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. I don't know which days the Lord's talking about. In Noah's day, there were three different days, 600 years before the flood. That's before the flood. During the flood, there was just about a year and a half. And after the flood, Genesis 9, the last two verses say he lived 350 years after the flood. So was the Lord talking about days before the flood, during the flood, or after the flood? I suggest before and after. You know what it was that was causing so much problem? Fornication. Where do you get that? Oh, Jude, verses 6 and 7. Before the flood, and the reason for the flood was because evil angels had sex relationship with human women. Contaminated the bloodline from which the Messiah, Jesus Christ, was to be born. And so God wiped out all of humankind except for eight people. Noah. Shem, Ham, and Jepheth were wise. All of them wiped out. Then there was during the flood, about a year and a half, after the flood, 350 years. In chapter 10 of the book of Genesis, in verses 19, it's talking about Ham's descendants. You see, the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Ham's, you know who the descendants of Ham were? Sodom. Son, Gomorrah. How about that? Well, what was going on there? Sodomy. Homosexuality. Running rampant. The days of Noah. Fornication. According to Jude, brother of Jesus. There we are. Jerusalem is key. God gave a politician, Donald Trump, wisdom. I don't even know if Donald Trump realized where he got it from. Wisdom named Jerusalem, political capital of this nation, set prophecy in place for a temple, tyrant, theocracy. where we are. That's where we are right now. Ready to put up the temple. Satanic activity running rampant. This is King of Kings coming after about a seven year tribulation period. How do we deal with it? Should that, if we should be here tonight or today, without Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, should, should that be a motivator? Make preparation for that next event, the rapture of the church? Absolutely. No greater motivator than to realize Jesus is coming You've got to be saved. What did Jesus preach? It's here on earth. I'm here to set up the kingdom. What's going to be preached in the tribulation period? The gospel of the kingdom to all the world. That's what pastor's going to be preaching on when he speaks on Revelation, the two witnesses. You know, their first fruits, 144,000 male virgin Jews. Just stay tuned for pastor. 
You'll see, they're going to reach out, Matthew 24, 14, to tell the entire world, people need to know Christ. Oh, they may not be here, but I heard pastors pray. You know what he said? On this mission field, it's where we are. There's others. I'm sure this church is reaching out there too. But what about us who know Christ as Lord and Savior and living pure? Paul told Titus, lay aside ungodliness and worldly lust. Then Titus said, Paul, how do I do that? Well, not only do I want you to do that, I want you to live godly, soberly, righteously. Now Titus said, hey, wait a minute. You're getting me frustrated, Paul. How do I lay aside that which is wrong and that which is right? You know what Paul said? Looking. Blessed hope. Grace up here. Live pure. Be productive. Well, he does come. Stage is set. Every actor. Temple. A tyrant. Theocracy in place. Jesus to shout. Heaven. Father, thank you for this awesome book. And it's amazing, articulate, accurate, authoritative book. It lays out for us all that we need to understand. If properly. Prepared, pure, and productive. Help us. We anticipate, even today, as our dear friend Matt sang, rapture take place. And as pastor, I go crazy when I see a rainbow. And if you ever see a double rainbow, ooh, I get out and run. I, I mean, I'm so excited about a double rainbow. It's just beauty. It's beautiful. It's tangible evidence of God being who he is and saying what he's going to do and following through on it. Now that's chapter 9. Chapter 10 is another genealogy. Chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel. Chapter 12 is the call of Abraham out of Ur the Chaldees. And that's the beginning of the Jewish people, and that's the program that God's going to put in place for the Jewish people from chapter 12 on. And during that 2,000-year period of time, there were only Gentiles upon the face of the earth. There were no Jews during that time. There were no Christians during that time. The Christians only come into existence after the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and extend to their border which would be the rapture of the church. That period of time between the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that period of time is the church age. And who gets saved during the church age? Gentiles or Jews? And what does God do? He takes Gentiles and Jews. They were at enmity with each other. Gentiles and Jews, Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 11, there was a wall of petition. He takes that wall out, makes two people one. They're not completed Jews. They're not Messianic Hebrews. They're Christians. Paul said, Philippians chapter 3, Hey, being a Jew, man, I was the best one. As it relates to Pharisees, check me out. I'm number one. According to the law, but then you know what he said in chapter 3? I count all of my Judaism as human dung. I don't know why people want to join Messianic fellowships or talk about completed Jews. I started a church in Jerusalem. You know what we call those people? Christians. Because that's what Paul, the Jew, said he was when he went to Antioch. It's a very important study. We can't separate the body of Christ. But that's coming from my study of the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis. Now, let me show you chapter 10. Remember ch chapter 6, 7, and 8, Noah and the flood, chapter 9? Look at chapter 9 just for a second, verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. Replenish the earth. Now, that's what he wants them to do. There's only eight people on the face of the earth at this time. Everybody, about a billion, had been wiped out. And now God wants to repeople the earth. 
Now notice in chapter 10, it's a genealogy, but it's the record of obedience. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Jepheth. Those are his three boys. They all had wives. And unto them were sons born after the flood. Now this is after the flood about 1,500 years after creation, about 4,500 years ago at the time of the flood. Round figures, of course. But look here in verse 2. The sons of Jephthah. Now notice just a couple of them. You might want to put a little star beside him in the scriptures. Gomer, Magog, skip a couple. Tubal, Meshach. Look at the last one in verse 3. Tagarma. Now if you've ever read Ezekiel 38, boy, those are players over here in Ezekiel chapter 38. I'll dig into that tomorrow a bit more. But these are major players. Wow. Oh, look at here in verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles. That's the very first time the word Gentiles is used. And it's talking about all of these people. They weren't Jews. They weren't Christians. They may have been a believing Gentile or a lost Gentile, but they were not Christians. You can't put Christians back there and be able to exegete or interpret the word of God properly. By these were the isles, verse 5, the isles of Gentiles divided. Now notice, in their lands, everyone after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. You see what's happening? After the flood, 4,500 years ago, nations begin. Look over here in verse 32. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. This is the establishment of nations, chapter 10. This is somewhat of a genealogy, and it's key to our understanding. Let me show you something else that's quite interesting. Look at verse 6. And the sons of Ham, Cush, Miseram, Put. Let me stop with those three. Wow. You know who they are? Cush is Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan. Put is Libya. Miseram is Egypt. Those are all, listen to me, Arab nations today. And Abraham's not even on the scene. If you've been learning or teaching, Abraham fathered the Arab world, uh-uh, that's -uh, incorrect. Abraham's not going to be born for 292 years later. Now, I don't have a medical degree. I have a PhD. I'm not bragging, simply making a statement. But I think I know about medicine enough to tell you a man before he's born 292 years cannot father some sons. Is that right? Do I hear an amen? Okay, thank you very much. And so Abraham is not the father of the Arab world. Neither is Ishmael. You ever read about Ishmael, 16th chapter of the book of Genesis? What did I tell you? Genesis is the beginning of Bible prophecy. It's a foundation. Chapter 16, Ishmael is born out of wedlock, basically. Chapter 17, in a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ, he appears to Abraham. And he talks about Ishmael. And he said, Ishmael, chapter 17, verse 20, will be the father of one nation. Not nations, plural, one nation. I, I don't know how plain it could be. He will father one nation. And then in chapter 25, verse 18 of the book of Genesis, Ishmael goes to live and it describes a piece of real estate that was known at that time as Arabia, Saudi Arabia today. Now, are we understanding what the Bible teaches? Not what the young teaches. I'm just simply quoting the scriptures. And so Abraham didn't father the Arab world, neither did Ishmael. He fathered one nation. And if you look... Look, Muhammad, you know what he said when he started the religiosity of Islam? He said, I'm a direct descendant of Ishmael. And what did it say in the 16th chapter? Ishmael will raise his hand against every man. Every man's hand will be raised against him. He'll be a crazy man. That's what the scripture says. And that's what's been going on. There were 12 sons that Ishmael had. They all started attacking each other. In fact, the stronger of the tribes of 12 would try to take the weaker tribes and bring them under their control, under their submission. Do you know what they called them? 
Islamic warriors. Because Islam means submission. It doesn't mean peace. Salam in the Arabic language means peace. Islam means submission. And that is what was going on when Muhammad started the Islamic faith. So there's information that we can glean from this. Now go back to chapter 10 for a moment, and let me show you that I want to tell you. And there's so much in here. I mean, I mentioned something this morning. I don't know if you caught it. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know who they were sons of? Uh, who uh, Ham's sons were? Sodom and Gomorrah. Look here in verse 19. And unto Sodom and Gomorrah and Adam. There it is. It's right there in the scripture. So you go back to the beginning of nations to find out the foundation for these nations. Now look at um, verse 21. Look at Shem. And also Shem, the father of all the children of Ebar, the brother of Jepheth, the elder given to him were children born. And the children of Shem, Elam, E-L-A-M. That's what we know today as Iran. Remember the prophet to the nations of the world? That was Jeremiah, remember? And he sets aside his 52 chapters, many of them focusing on nations and projecting what the prophecy is going to be on those nations. Ezekiel does the exact same thing. When you look at the book of Ezekiel, the first 32 chapters are a message of retribution. Chapters 1 to 24, retribution of the Jewish people. Chapters 25 to 32, a message to, of retribution to the neighbors of the Jewish people. So Elam is mentioned. Iran is mentioned in both of these passages of Scripture. So at this point, I don't want to keep going deeper and deeper because of the time reference that we have to follow. But I want you to know Elam is the father of the Iranian people today. Go over to the book of Second Chronicles just a second. If I would jump through the pages of Scripture and come over to Second Chronicles, I could show you how the people, and they were at that time biblically referred to as the Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire. I want to show you what's happening. When you're looking at Second Chronicles chapter 36, you're looking at Nebuchadnezzar coming from Babylon. This will be the third wave as he comes into Israel. And he's going to take all of Israel out. He's going to destroy the temple. He's going to devastate the city. And he's either going to kill all the Jews or take them into the captivity. Start here in verse 7 of chapter 36 of Second Chronicles. And Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple in Babylon. Verse 18. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all of these brought he to Babylon. And then they burned down the house of God, and they break down the wall of Jerusalem, and they burned all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the godly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away into Babylon. Look at verse 21. Why did this all take place? To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 11, chapter 29 and verse 10, God gifted Jeremiah with a prophecy that the Jewish people would be out of the land for a 70-year period of time. And why was that? Well, Leviticus chapter 25 said they were to rest the land every seventh year to give it a Shabbat, a Sabbath, a sabbatical. They didn't do that for how long? 490 years. You divide seven to 490, you have 70 years. When God tells you to do something, if you don't do it, he'll do it, and he'll give you the exact same time frame. And so that's what they were going to be out of the land. That's why they were out of the land for a 70-year period of time. And now why is this happening, which I just told you about Nebuchadnezzar? To fulfill Jeremiah's prophecy. Again, verse 22. Now the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. Again, we're seeing this is to fulfill prophecy. What did I teach this morning? What was my principle? Political leaders make political decisions to set prophecy in place. God used the prophet Jeremiah to say the Jews would be out of the land because they didn't obey me. They didn't rest the land. 
And so he raises up a man named Cyrus. In fact, Isaiah, Isaiah chapters 44 and 45, God raised up a man named Cyrus. 150 years before the fact, he named the man. He said he would be my anointed one. You know what that word in Hebrew is for anointed? Mashiach. Same as the Messiah. He didn't say he was going to be the Messiah. He would be an anointed one by me, my servant, to do what I want him to do. And he said that 150 years before the fact. Now God raises up Cyrus, a political leader, the most powerful man in the world. He raises up Cyrus to do exactly what he wanted to have done. Look at chapter 1 of the book of Ezra, right across the page. Verse 2. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven, hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's the most powerful man on the earth. And he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. What house? The temple. Have you ever read Ezra? First six chapters is talking about building the temple. The Babylonian Empire fell in 539 B.C. When was the temple rebuilt? About 515 B.C., almost 40 years later. What were the Jewish people doing? They're building their own houses. Who cares about what God wants us to do? You know, there's so much practical information. I'm almost ready to start preaching and chasing rabbits all over the place. But it is key to do what God said to do. And if you don't do it, he's going to make you do it. It's unbelievable. He brings up two prophets at this time in history, Haggai and Zechariah. Boy, two prophets, contemporaries, the total opposite. I mean, Zechariah was a suave, good-looking type prophet, like your pastor, okay? And he was, just, he was just that kind of guy. And Haggai, he was a crusty old man like me. And so these were two prophets. Go to the fifth chapter. Fifth chapter of the book of Ezra. Notice what it says. Then the prophets Haggai and the prophet Zechariah, the son of Ido, Edo, they prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judea and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel and unto them. And he said, Zerubbabel brought you back here to build the temple. Get in there and build the temple. By the way, let me just show you this side trail for a moment. Chapter 2. In chapter 2, there's 71 verses here. You want to know something? At this time in history, God brings all 12 tribes back into the land. There's no such thing as 10 lost tribes. They're all in the land. Just read through it. It's like a genealogy. It says so-and-so will come in, and this is how many people will come in his family. Look here, let me give you two examples. Verse 28. The men of Bethel and I, they don't say A-I, I in Hebrew, 223. Bethel. Oh, that's where the leader of the ten tribes in the north was when he took them into the north and ultimately to the Assyrian Empire when they were taken out of the land. By the way, who defeated the Assyrian Empire? The Babylonian Empire. And when you defeat an empire, you take all of its population. And so all those in those ten so-called lost tribes, ten in the north called Israel, they were all accumulated. And then he comes back and look over here, verse 29. And the children of Nebo, 50 and 2. Well, who is that? Well, that's Reuben, one of the 12 leaders, not those 10 that went north. Reuben, who is going to be a part of all these tribes. When you get to chapter 26, when they have the dedicatory service for the temple, all 12 tribes are there. Look at chapter 6 just for a second. Verse 15, and this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king, and the children of Israel. That word Israel is used three ways in the Bible. It's either Jacob's name, after God had a wrestling match with him, or it's the 12 tribes, all 12 tribes together, or it's the 10 tribes in the north. That's the only way the word Israel is ever used. So it asks, how do you tell? It's the context. And so this is either Jacob, who's long dead, or 
It's going to be the 10 tribes out of the north or all 12 tribes. It's all 12 tribes. How do I know? We'll keep reading here. Verse 16. And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites. Oh, well, they're apart. They weren't in the two tribes, so they're apart. Hmm. And the rest of the children of the captivity. Wow, just like I said. All those in the Assyrian Empire, defeated by the Babylonian Empire, were caught into captivity. And now all 12 tribes are back in Israel. They keep the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered at the dedication of this house of God 100 bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs. And now notice, for a sin offering for all, A-L-L, for all of Israel, 12 he goats according to the number of the tribes of Israel. All 12 tribes are back in the land. This is 2,500 years ago. When Jesus sent the disciples out two by two, Matthew chapter 10, what did he say? Don't go to the Gentiles. Go to the whole, hello, whole house of Israel. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, verse 5, there were Jews from every nation of the world. No such thing as ten lost tribes. Don't be misled by some so-called prophecy teacher. And it's key that we understand these words from God's word. All of it plays a key role in understanding what we're talking about. So that means when Cyrus, listen, the head of the Medo-Persian Empire came into the land. He brought all 12 tribes back in the land. This is a silver This is the temple of the temple. All 12 tribes have paid the temple. You know who mentioned this? The Sanhedrin. 70 wise Jewish scholars. In honor of Cyrus, king of Persia, who brought all 12 tribes back in the land, who allowed them to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. They honored him with this unbelievable silver half shepherd. The temple tax. That's what they thought about Persia before 1936. Because in 1936, it was the year when they changed Persia's name from Persia to Iran. And in fact, the Iranian people still speak Persian today. And that's the past. That's a foundation that I believe we need to have to understand what's going on. Let me tell you about the present. I've been a journalist covering the news for many, many years. Started way back when I was in the Air Force, back in the old ages, the dark ages. And I was doing that at that point in time, learning. And ultimately, when I ended up going to Israel, Judy and I couldn't go in as missionaries. You can't get a passport that way or a visa. And so we had to come in as fully credentialed journalists. And Judy and I, for the 28 years we've been there, fully credentialed journalists. And it was God's plan. It opened up opportunity. How do you think I was able to interview Benjamin Netanyahu three times? Not because of Jimmy DeYoung. He had no idea who Jimmy DeYoung was. I was a journalist. How do you think I got to get to Yasser Arafat? I'm a journalist. King Hussein. I'm a journalist. So many of the other leaders of Israel. Not because of me, I'm a nothing, but I am a journalist. And that's how I got there. It was November of 1979. Went over to the White House to cover a story. Jimmy Carter, then president, was meeting with the Shah of Iran. He was the leader of the Iranian nation at that time. But Jimmy Carter was high on human rights. You might remember that. And he didn't like the way the Shah was treating the Iranian people. So he called him in the White House. Now, I'm outside. I'm covering the story. There are just thousands of Iranians outside the White House. They're calling for Jimmy Carter 
to pull down the Shah of Iran, to cut off all foreign aid, to do away with any relationship with Iran because of his human rights record. And Jimmy Carter followed through. And then in 1980, there was an exile in Paris, France, who made his way back into Tehran, Iran. His name, Ayatollah Ali Khomeini, who introduced the Islamic Republic, the only Islamic nation, not even Saudi Arabia is this way, the powerful cities of Mecca and Medina. No, an Islamic Republic, you know what that means? They live totally by the Sharia. Now, to say Sharia law is, you know, duplication. Sharia means law, so I don't say law, law. Sharia, the Quran, what it says. And that's the establishment of the Islamic Republic, which Ayatollah Ali Khomeini was responsible for. And Jimmy Carter made the statement, oh, he's an old man. He'll be kind with everybody. Hello? A president making a political decision to set prophecy in place. It's a principle. Book of Revelation chapter 17, verse 17. Oh, by the way, that was applicable back there in 2 Chronicles 36 with King Nebuchadnezzar. And it was applicable over there in Ezra chapter 1 with King Cyrus. Prophesied 150 years before he comes on the scene by name. God's got a plan. He uses political leaders to make political decisions to set prophecy in place. Along comes another president, Barack Obama. Now, what does he do in the first six months he's in presidency? Goes to Cairo, Egypt. What does he say? Hey, the United States is not against the Muslim world. We're not at war with Islam. We love you people. Hello? Wow. Oh, I think, if I remember correctly, he was the one who put together the Iranian nuclear deal. Hello? That gave them 150 billion, a B, 150 billion dollars to separate among their proxies, among their sponsorship of Islamic terror organizations. Hezbollah. They moved Hezbollah into southern Lebanon, 1982. You know what the first thing they did? Blew up a marine barracks and killed 280 marines. Hey, Carter, an old man who loves everybody, huh? Oh, so who are you talking about, Barack Obama? Presidents making political decisions to set prophecy in place. It's a principle of God's word. God brought human government into existence to direct this world as to what's going to happen. Let me quickly move up to today. And there are three oil tankers in the Persian Gulf. That's where 30% of all the oil of the world is collected, put in tankers. They go out the Strait of Hormuz to be delivered across the world. That is a choke point for the Iranians. And so they fire at three tankers. They then admit they shot a U.S. drone out of the sky. And they're using Hezbollah in southern Lebanon, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, Islamic Jihad in the Sinai, the Huftis in Yemen, all proxies for this Islamic radical terrorist state. Now, I'm not attacking from hatred. I'm attacking from fact. Fact, especially when they admit they shot the drone out of the sky. All of this coming together. 
You know how we knew the military in America that Iran was getting ready to go on a march against the United States? One of the members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. In fact, you know what his position was? He was chief of in, in, Iranian intelligence. He separated, he withdrew, went to Israel, spilled all the information to Mossad. Mossad then contacted the intelligence community in America. That's how we started moving. All of this information to see what's going on. That's the past, the present. Let me look at the prophetic with you. Go over to the book of Daniel. Daniel. Let's go over there to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 is one of the most prophetic passages of Scripture that you could ever run into. It mentions five personalities, and Daniel prophesies about them before they ever show up the, on the scene. In verse 2, it talks about King Ahasuerus 59 years before he ever comes. He was the leader of the Persian Empire. You remember Esther, Ezra, don't you? I mean Esther. That was Ahasuerus. And then 200 years before Alexander the Great came on the scene, verses 3 and 4 of the book of Daniel, he talks about him. And then 300 years before the leader of the king of the north and the king of the south, the king of the north, Antiochus the Great, the king of the south, who had a daughter who he offered in marriage to Antiochus. Well, that was geographically modern-day Syria. The king of the south, modern-day Egypt. Well, that's natural. Ezekiel 5.5 5 says God put Jerusalem in the center of the earth in all direction in the Bible. It's from Jerusalem. Oh, you remember Antiochus Epiphanes, the one who desecrated the temple by slaughtering a pig in the middle of the temple, throwing its innards all over? It was the original abomination of desolation, a prototype of what the Antichrist is going to do. That was recorded 360 years before the fact by the prophet Daniel. Chapter 11, verses 11 to 34. Wow. And then there's one more. Antichrist. Chapter 11, verses 36 and following. He describes the Antichrist. Look here. Have you got chapter 11? Notice here just a second. Now, that's not the point, but I want to show you this because it's key. Verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. He'll be a willful king. My way or the highway, buddy. You get in the game or get out of the town. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Boy, that's pretty good. I'm the best there is. I'm better than any god. Hmm. And he shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation come. Look here in verse 37. The women shall not desire him. They shall hate him. Hmm. Verse 38. And he will... Worship the God of forces, a military genius. I'm not making this up, folks. I'm reading it from the Word of God. That's describing the Antichrist 2,500 years before he ever comes on the scene. This is God's Word. Now, when you get to verse 40, it's starting to talk about the nations who will align themselves against the Jewish nation of Israel. There's list of these nations in Daniel 11, where we are now, in Ezekiel chapter 38, and in Psalm 83. Let me just show you a couple of them. Notice verse 40, and at the time of the end, now that phrase is used three times here in Daniel, chapter 11 twice, chapter 12 once. You have to determine that word by what time it is and what the context is. Let me go to the microphone stand over here. Let me just show you something. Let's pretend like this represents the next event on God's calendar of activity. In other words, what's going to happen next in God's plan for prophecy is the rapture of the church. There's no prophecy that has to be fulfilled before the rapture. We're snug up against this event. The rapture is the next thing to happen. It has not happened yet. I can prove that. Pastor and I are still here. Should we disappear during the service, you're going to have some kind of a little problem, I tell you that. But if the rapture does happen during the service, just see the deacons. They'll take care of you, okay? 
Um, are there any deacons here tonight? If you're a deacon, raise your hand. Well, God bless you. Got one. How many deacons do you have, Pastor? Five. Well, they're absent. Four of them are. You got to check it out. Anyway, <laughs> let me tell you something, folks. The rapture hasn't happened yet. It's ready to happen. And what's the first thing after the rapture? This alignment of nations. Iran, a major player. The nations are listed here. Look at verse 44. This is interesting. But tidings out of the east and out of the north. Now, using direction from the word of God out of Jerusalem, what's to the east? Modern day Iran, biblical Persia. Oh, and what is to the north? Well, when you notice verse 40, they wipe out Syria, which is due north of Israel at Israel's northern border. I'm sure you've read Isaiah 17, where it says Damascus is going to be destroyed five times, Isaiah 17. This is the time on God's plan when Damascus is destroyed. Oh, and then the king of the north. Well, if you've wiped out what's your first north, you go to Russia. That's due north. And Russia, they will form an Islamic coalition. The bottom line, the lowest common denominator, these nations will be Islamic. Now, I've showed you Syria and Egypt is listed here by name. And out of the east, Iran and Russia. Wow. Go to Ezekiel 38. Take back Ezekiel chapter 38. Let me show you a couple of more. Let me just show you. This is all as it relates to Iran and what they are doing. Ezekiel chapter 38. And look here at verse 2. Ezekiel 38 and verse 2. Son of man, set thy face against Gog, that's the person, in the land of Magog, that's the place. And the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Look at verse 6. And Gomer and all of his bands in the house of Tagarma. Oh, I think we already read that this evening. That was Genesis chapter 10. Those are the sons of Jepheth, grandsons of Noah, Gentiles that established 4,500 years ago, these nations. Wow. Oh, look at verse 5. Persia. I said until 1936, Persia was known as Persia. In 36, they changed their name to Iran. Oh, here, we're, we're looking at this alignment of nations. And so in Daniel chapter 11, Syria and Egypt, and the book, oh, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Tagarma? Well, if you would have been at live in the time of Peter and Paul, you'd have gone into Asia Minor for ministry. You know what Asia Minor of that day is today? Modern day Turkey. That's Turkey. In fact, look at any ancient map on Asia Minor. It's divided into four parts. You know what they are? Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Tagarma. I'm not making this up. This is a study of God's word. Go, go back to Psalm 83 just for a second. Let me just show you something in Psalm 83. Now notice what they're going to do. They're going to come together. And this is King David praying that the Lord would wake up and not allow this to happen. But look what is going to have a council meeting. Verse 4. And they will come out of the council meeting. And they will say, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no more be in remembrance. You hear that word coming from Hamadanijad, who was the president for eight years of Iran? Let's wipe them off the face of the earth that her name be forgotten forever. I'm reading from the prophetic word of God. This is almost like reading from the newspaper. Oh, look here. There's a couple of other nations that weren't listed in the other. Look here in verse 6. And the tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites. Where did I tell you Ishmael went? Arabia. The Ishmaelites. He's talking about Saudi Arabia. Look down here in verse 7, the last one. Tyre. Tyre and Sidon? That's modern day Lebanon. You see the players? They're moving into position. They're getting ready to accomplish their goal 
of coming together, wiping Israel off the face of the earth, that her name be forgotten forever. I'm not making it. I'm reading from the word of God, folks. I'm just showing you the prophetic passages of what's going to happen in the very near future. It's going to happen in the first six months after the rapture of the church during the first six months of the tribulation period. And tonight, as I stand here teaching, tonight in Kenetro, if you've ever been to Israel, you probably pointed out Kenetro. In the Six Day War of 1967, Hafas al Assad was then president of Syria. His son Bashar Assad is now the president. He evacuated an entire community in Kenetra, two and a half miles north of Israel's border. It was a propaganda ploy. He wanted to say to the world, we're scared to death of those Jews in Israel. That's on the northern side of the border. You know what's on the southern side? The greatest apple orchards of any place in the world in Israel's northern border region. You cannot taste a better apple. And in the apple orchard, working the orchard, the fathers, the mothers, the children. But who's afraid of who? Israel's over here living a normal life. But what is happening in Kenetra? Bashar Assad, fighting for his political life. Russia and Iran come in to prop him up. And he's winning that seven-year civil war that's responsible for killing half a million Syrians and dispersing two million of them around the world. And so what does he do? He brings his military forces to Kenetra. He brings along with him the Iranian Revolutionary Guard there, over 120,000 of them in Syria. They have 12 military bases. Russia has two naval ports on the coast of the Mediterranean. They have four Air Force bases. But they move their forces down to Kenetra. Hezbollah comes over to fight from southern Lebanon to fight the Jewish people. And less than two weeks ago, Bashar Assad says, we're taking back the Golan Heights. We'll take it back diplomatically or militarily. Tonight, my dear friend, they're two and a half miles away from Israel's border. All of this prophesied by the prophets David, King David, Ezekiel, and Daniel. All perfect in their previous predictions. We're at the spot. We're at the spot where it's ready to happen. There's only one thing that must happen before they attack. One thing. And if you come back tomorrow night, I'll tell you. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, Thank you for this awesome book. It's an amazing, articulate, accurate, authoritative book. And Lord, you give us this information. Not so we can brag about what we know about Bible prophecy. You give us this information so it will cause us to change our lifestyle. I remember, Lord, reading over in Daniel chapter 10, where Jesus made a pre-incarnate appearance to visit with Daniel. In fact, Daniel had been fasting for three weeks, 21 days, wanting that to happen. And so Jesus shows up. Daniel falls on his face, and the Lord lifts him up by the hand and says, Daniel, stand up, buddy. He said, I'm amazed. I came because you had the desire to learn Bible prophecy. And since you set your heart to understand the times, I've been on the way. Now that was Daniel's reaction to the prophecy he had been 
given. He had been reading. And now with the appearance of Jesus Christ. And Jesus' thinking was, boy, Daniel, you're hungry for studying and understanding the times. Since you set your heart to understand the times. That's the first part of the verse. You know what the second part of the verse is? And chasten your heart in light of this knowledge. Knowing Bible prophecy could be an exercise in futility if you didn't make it applicable. Since you set your heart to understand the times, that's the predictive aspect of Bible prophecy. And chasten your heart in light of that knowledge, that's the practical aspect of Bible prophecy. I don't know if you've ever read, heads bowed, please, eyes closed, nobody moving. I don't know if you ever read the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. Verse 2 records that Daniel was having his quiet time in the book of Jeremiah. He was reading from Jeremiah how long he would be in the captivity. And now at 85 years of age, as Daniel was reading Jeremiah, he recognized he left when he was 15. Now 85, that's 70 years in the captivity. You know what Daniel did? He didn't send out a communique across the country and say, Oh, Daniel the prophet's going to be holding prophecy meetings all over. Come and hear him speak. No. Daniel fell on his face, confessed his sin, started praying for his people, confessed their sins. That's practical. Not a whole lot of people here tonight, but a good, good portion who could really make an impact on this church. And you could do that if you did what Daniel did. Confess your sins. Boy, revival broke out when Daniel was there. Unbelievable. 20 chapters of Daniel's reaction to his understanding of Bible prophecy chastening his heart. Now, how would Daniel confess his sins? Well, he went to the temple and he offered a sin offering. But how would we, if we wanted to have the same results, how would we confess our sins? Name them and agree with God about our sin. Just look at First John sometimes 1.9. If we will confess our sins, not ask forgiveness, confess, agree with God about our sin. If we will confess our sins, he'll be faithful and just to convert, can forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dear friend, 1 John 1, 9 was written to Christians how to restore fellowship, how to have a relationship. Has your relationship been good with the Lord? Wow. You could be the center of a great revival. A great revival. And I'm not trying to be unkind, but a church of 500 ought to have more than 50 in the Sunday night service. Well, oh, that's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong. And maybe it's because the core hasn't confessed their sin. So I want to close tonight very practical. Nobody leaving, please. Nobody looking around. I want you to just stop for a moment. I want you to confess your sins. Oh, you don't know what you've done. Well, the Lord will bring it to your mind. He'll bring that sin to your mind. So not to me or pastor, 
We're both sinners, especially me. But I want you to confess your sin, agree with God about how your life has been, and ask him to make you a core worthy of the days in which we're living. So pause a moment. Confess your sin. Allow the Lord to do that through you. What can wash away my sin? Sing it with me. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus.